All right. Uh, I want to announce the date. Uh, today is March 23rd of 2024, and we are beginning a new book. What book are we beginning? Oh, I'm so proud of you guys. You didn't say Leviticus. You said Vaikra. <clears throat> when you hear the word Leviticus, what comes to your mind? Oh, yeah, law, blood. But what's interesting, in Hebrew, the book isn't called Leviticus. It's called Vaikra. Why is it called Vaikra? Because the first five books of the Torah, they call the book by one of the first words within the first book. So, for example, Genesis, they don't say Genesis, they say Bereshit, because that's the first word of the Bible in Hebrew, Bereshit. And what does Bereshit mean? In the beginning. Now, Exodus, they don't say Exodus, they say Shemot. And what does Shemot mean? Name, Shem is name. So Shemot is plural, names. Okay, Shemot is, and how that book begins is these are the names. Okay. Now Leviticus, they don't say Leviticus, they say Vaikra. And Vaikra, what does that mean? To call out. But there's a big difference that you're going to see between Vaikra and Vaikar. Vaikar is just calling out. Vaikra is calling in an intimate, personal way. Big difference that I'm going to talk about here. <clears throat> Okay, and then comes numbers, but they don't call it numbers. What do they call that book? And what does Bamidbar mean? In the wilderness. Okay, what's interesting is Davar, which is the last part of Ba, Ba is in. Okay, Ba, Midbar, the wilderness, is the word Davar, which means the word. We find the word of God, we can hear it better in the wilderness when we get rid of all the noise pollution. Okay, and then finally is Deuteronomy, but what do they call it? Devarim. These are the words. So when they, when they bring out the book of Deuteronomy, they're really saying, okay, let's go look at these are the words. Now, when you get rid of the English mindset of Genesis through Deuteronomy and you put in the Hebrew names, <clears throat> you have in the beginning, these are the names the Lord called out into the wilderness, and these are his words. Uh, that, this, is, this is why it makes a huge difference. <clears throat> now, here's something I want to point out. The book of Leviticus, okay, and the book of Exodus, and the book of Genesis. How long were they in the wilderness? Okay, so I have a little pyramid. They leave Egypt. They're 40 years in the wilderness, and then they get to the promised land right? And the book of Exodus we just left, what was the time frame of the book of Exodus? One year. They left on Nisan, uh, you know, 14, Passover, Nisan 15. Nisan 1, God tells Moses, okay, this is the beginning, all right? And then they leave Egypt, you cross the Red Sea, they get to Mount Sinai, and they stay there for one year. And then the last chapter of Exodus, chapter 40, is the very day on Nisan 1 when the glory falls. And so now Leviticus picks it up from there. So the whole book of Exodus covers one year. Now we come to Vaikra or Leviticus. How, what's the time frame for the book of Leviticus? One month. The entire book of Leviticus covers just one month, 30 days. That's all it covers, okay? Along that line, Deuteronomy is one month. It's the last month of the 40 years. It's Moses' final words, his eulogy, basically going over the last 40 years. So we really don't know, have a clue about what happened in the wilderness. Out of the 40 years, we got, you know, a, a year at the beginning, uh, a month at the end. Uh, now the book Bamid Bar, our numbers that talks about it, really doesn't cover the whole 40 years. It just covers a, a snapshot here and there. 
But let's take the big picture look at this. <clears throat> Here we have Genesis covers 2,300 years, the book of Genesis. Then the book of Exodus covers one year. And then Leviticus covers one month. Do you see that God is focusing on something? This is why this book is so amazing. Uh, and this is the first book Jews teach their children. They don't teach them Genesis. They don't teach them Exodus. And they teach them at three years old is when they start teaching and they focus on the book of Leviticus. Well, just like the pupil of an eye. You got your iris. And, and, but this is the most important book in the whole Torah because God is taking the entire book to focus on one month. Think about that. And Genesis, that one book covered 2,300 years. Exodus is one year. Leviticus, the all of creation is pointing to this. Genesis talks about the creation of mankind and pulling out a people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right? Uh, and then in here, Exodus, we hear about that nation being called out of all the nations to a promised land. Leviticus is all about God's home. It's all about the temple. It's all about the tabernacle. God is focusing this entire book on man building a place for him. Here, I mean, think about this. Look at all this huge book of 2,300 years. God never talked about how he created the universe. It's not about him. But he has a whole book focused just on man building a place for him. To me, that is absolutely incredible. Now, here's something else. The first commandment, and some people didn't understand what I was saying. How many people will take what you're saying and change it and run with it? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Okay, the, I didn't say the first of the Ten Commandments. I didn't say the greatest commandment. I said the first commandment that God gave to Israel was in Egypt, and it was to get on his calendar. That's what it is. God is going to do something for someone. Well, if you remember Noah's Ark, God had a time to close the door. And if you came after the door was closed, too late. And so God is saying, guess what, Israel? I want to marry you, but you're going to do it according to my calendar. Okay? Uh, do you tell your boss when you want to go to work? Or does the boss tell you when you're supposed to come to work? God says that from the very beginning, if we're going to have a relationship, you got to get on my schedule. That was the first commandment, the calendar, keeping of the calendar. Okay. But then there also were three future commandments that were given to Israel before they ever entered the promised land. Who can tell me what the three future commandments were given to Israel before they ever entered the promised land? Okay, number one was in Deuteronomy 12, 5. God says, you have to build me a place to live. He says, I want you to build a habitation for God, but God says you have to do it where I decide. That's a Deuteronomy 12, 5. Remember, they're, not, they're in the wilderness. This is Moses' final month before they enter. And God is telling Moses that down the road, one of the first commands, I want you to build a habitation where I decide. He says, where I will put my name. The second one, he says in Deuteronomy 17, 15, is when you decide you want a king over you, I decide who the king is going to be. Okay? And then the third command that is also so important is Deuteronomy 25, 19. You better kill Amalek. That was the final commandment. But they have to kill Amalek when God decides. Isn't this fascinating? These are the three commandments given before they ever entered Israel. Build a place for God. When you set a king, I'm going to decide. And you have to finish off Amalek. Now, what's fascinating, why do countries engage in war? Basically, there's two reasons. Uh, they either want to defend themselves or they want to attack and take over more land for more resources. 
I mean, that's pretty simple. Two reasons, either to defend themselves to go to war or to attack. Now, when you think about this, why did Amalek attack Israel? They're coming out of Egypt. They're the first nation to attack Israel. And who do they attack? The stragglers, the innocent elderly, the innocent children, the weak, the injured. That's who Amalek attacks. But they didn't attack them for more land. They didn't have any. Israel didn't have any. Okay? And they didn't attack them because they were defending themselves. It's because, you know, they're just walking through. So what is the reason behind Amalek's attack? It was an attack on Torah. It was an attack on God's instruction. It was an attack on God's people. And that's what is going on today. There is no legitimate reason. There really isn't. Amalek was waging a war on Torah. Now, as I said, the first book taught to the Jewish children at three years old It's also the heart of the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, there's Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, now, I asked earlier what comes to mind when you think of Leviticus. Many people think of blood. All right, but it's more than that. Okay, first off, the whole book of Leviticus takes place basically on Nisan 1. All right, but it only lasts one month. It's it's the entire month of Nisan. It's the grand opening ceremony of the tabernacle. Now, the word blood appears in Leviticus about 70 times. Uh, The other thing I want to point out is that Leviticus is actually the last chapter of Genesis or Exodus. I mean, the Exodus. All right, Uh, it's a continuation of it because Exodus 40 ends with God's glory falling and Moses can't enter. And then now we see, okay, here's how you enter. So it's really the same day. Now, oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at last week as we close in Exodus 40, as we close the book of Exodus, verse 33 to 35. This is on Nisan 1 now, guys. Moses reared up the court around the tabernacle and the altar. He set up the screen of the gate of the court, and Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And look at this. The whole purpose of the tabernacle was they could enter. But Moses can't enter into the tent of the meeting because the cloud abode there. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, what's fascinating about this, what this also is, is Genesis chapter 1 all over again. This is the rectification of them being kicked out of the garden and being separated. And now God and man is coming back together. Okay. Um, Let me see. Yeah, Exodus 40. I think I I, I missed that. Verse 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, On the first day of the first month, you're to set up the tabernacle. So the first day of the first month is what? They saw one. So we see, I'm showing this is the day. And how many of you know the first day of the first month is not January 1st? Okay. So here, the big day, God's glory falls. And the very first thing we find is Moses could not enter the tabernacle. But this time, instead of God building a place for us, we are building a place for God. This is the, like the first step of repentance is you try to rectify. So here... Man messed up in Genesis 1 and 2, and now Leviticus, here is man trying to rectify it by us building a place for God. But the most important thing is we have to do it according to his direction, not the way we think he would like it. How often do people give you something they think you would like, and it's really the last thing you'd want? What do they call those? White elephant gifts? Something along that line? You know? Okay. Okay. This time, mankind is building a dwelling place for God at God's direction. And so mankind was inviting the God of creation to draw near. And we want to draw near to him. Now, a scary proposition as a few months earlier, they did not want to draw close to God as God had wanted. They wanted to, you know, they were afraid. First off, God said, look, don't you come near or you're going to die. 
when I'm visiting the Mount Sinai, stay back. But now God is saying, draw close, draw near. And so in Leviticus 1, 1, here we begin. It says, and, and because it begins with and, that tells you it's really tied to Exodus. Okay, it's a conjunction. And the Lord called to Moses and spoke it to him out of the tent of meeting. What does this tell us? The entire book of Leviticus is about the Lord calling. Okay, now look at this. Here is Leviticus 1, 1, and this is at the beginning is Vaikra. Now the Vav at the very beginning is the word ant. A Vav is like a nail and it connects things. So when you see the letter Vav, it's almost always the word ant. Okay, and, ha, uh, and he, the Yud, kara, called. So the Lord is calling out. And who's he calling out to? El Moshe to Moses via the bar. And he said, or and said, the Yud, he, vav, he. So this is in Hebrew, the beginning of uh, Ikra. And so what do we find here? And he called. And God is saying, pick up, pick up. I'm calling you. This is why we have to make sure we have the connection right. Okay, so that is the word end. But here's what's amazing. And it's like this in every Torah scroll for thousands of years. The letter all left is not that size like it should be. It's made real small. Wow. Why is it made real small? Now here is a from a Torah. And you can see how small the letter all left is. Do you see that? What is going on here? Well, that is what I want to tell you, how it is a personal call. The last time we heard the, oh, in the tent of meeting, okay, uh, let me show you this. It's called the tent of meeting, but this is the word for the word meeting. Does anyone, can anyone tell me what that word is? Moed. Okay, that's my way. A divine appointment. The tent of meeting is the festival. It's the meeting. If you want to meet, you got to meet at the meeting place. And so God says, here's what I'm going to meet with you at the meeting place. So that's the word moed uh, in this verse. But now listen to this. In Genesis 3, 9, Adam and Eve are hiding behind a bush. And it says, and the Lord God called out to the man and said, where are you? How many of you knew knew that God knew where he was? Okay. So God says, it's Vaikra. It's very personal. It's Adam. (laughs) Where are you, Adam? Okay. It's not just a random call. But here's what's interesting. Most people, it's, Susie, get in here. Johnny, where are you? It's a, this kind of, and it's not how God did it. The word vaikra is an expression of love, closeness, preciousness. So when God called out to Adam, it was, wasn't out of anger. You broke my laws. It was like, Adam, <laughs> I'm missing you. I want to spend time with you. Where are you? See, so I want people to understand the tone of the Bible, not just the words. So here's the thing. First off, it says in Leviticus that God called out to who? Moses. And some say that Moses was embarrassed to have to write, and the Lord called out to me, you know, and he wrote, and the Lord called out to Moses. But how many know, how many of us know Moses was so humble? He didn't want people to think they say that he was so close to God personally that God would actually say that to him. And so he made the all left small. You know, and I thought that was fascinating. But it also, you can look at it this way, that God, the all left stands for what? Elohim, Adonai, that stands for God. But what is God doing? He is humbling himself making room for humanity to be a part. I mean, all of this is amazing to me. First Kings 
1912. If you remember, after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small voice. God does not have to yell. God does not have to scream. God can just go, Susie, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> uh, and it's that still small voice that will shake us in our boots. As a matter of fact, this is one of my favorite verses, Micah 6, 8. It, doesn't, well, it says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? What does God require of us? Do justly, love mercy, and to do what else? Walk humbly with God. It doesn't say walk humbly in front of me, the mighty God. God's saying, I'm very humble. Will you be humble and walk? Will you humble yourself in front of the mighty God who's humble? I mean, this is incredible. We have such a humble God. He doesn't, he's very self-assured. <laughs> he, he doesn't need our affirmation. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you knew this, but there was no offering was ever accepted by God without humility. None of the offerings were ever accepted without humility. Uh, look at Leviticus 2.9. It says, the priest will take off from the meal offering the memorial part and shall make it be like smoke on the altar, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. Now, how many of you, when you're barbecuing and it's smoking like crazy, like to have your face over the smoke? No, it burns. <laughs> ah, it gets up in your nose. Okay, but do you know the word sweet savor appears 39 times? So in other words, when God smells our offerings, he doesn't want smoke in his nose. He wants a pleasant aroma like you get when your neighbor is barbecuing <laughs> and you're smelling it waft over the fence. All right. But look at Isaiah 65, 5. Who's he talking about? He's talking about those who stand by their self and they say, don't come near to me for I am holier than you. Well, God says, these people are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all day long. So often people, uh, we are to be holy, he commands us to be holy, but too many people think I'm holier than you. you know, and that's not what God likes and that's not what we're supposed to be doing. True holiness is true humility. And this you need to know about humility. So many people misunderstand humility. Humility is never putting yourself down. Humility is forgetting about yourself. That's what true humility is. It's not about me, okay? Now, let's go to Numbers 23.1 or 23.16. Here, the Lord met Balaam. Now, I want to show you something. Here we go. Here, it's in uh, Exodus or Leviticus, it was Vayikra, right? But here, it's Vayikar. There's no Aleph at the end. Remember the small A, the big A? God is speaking out, okay, and called the yud heh vav to Balaam. There's the B L. A.M. Balaam. So the Lord is calling out to Balaam, but he doesn't vayikra him. He vayikars. There's no relationship. And see, this is why Hebrew is so much better than English, because you can get the emotions, so to speak. The emojis are built into the Hebrew, and you don't get the emojis in English. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's see. The interesting, too, is when there's no left, it implies happenstance, chance, you know. Uh, it's not like a personal relationship when you're talking to someone. You just happen to see somebody and call. Now, um, it also implies, Vayakar also implies a connotation of contamination. Balaam's contaminated, and here I got to talk to him. Okay, now what this book is about is how we do draw near. God wants his, his house. Some of us, I don't know if there's anyone here, take your shoes off before you enter my house. Okay, <clears throat> God is saying, I have some protocol. 
you are contaminated, and before you enter my house, I want you to go through a decontamination process. All right? Now, the first seven chapters of Leviticus describe five different classifications of sacrifices, which were always accompanied with wine or water libations. Here they are. Now, you can take a picture of that if you want to, but I have it here. And this is where Christians misunderstand, because did you know there was no offerings for intentional sin? There weren't any offerings for intentional sin. Okay, and so many Christians think, well, they did sacrifices for their sins. No, they didn't. First off, these are voluntary. If they were sins they, uh, for sin, they'd be mandatory. These are voluntary offerings. The first offering is the burnt offering, which is called the Ola offering, and this is Leviticus 1. Then the grain offering, Minka, is Leviticus 2. The peace offering, or the Shalamim, is Leviticus 3. The sin offering, which is sins of ignorance, Katat, Leviticus 4. Guilt offering, Asham, Leviticus 5. But let me explain why there was never a offering for intentional sin. If there was an offering for intentional sin, and if you murdered someone, it cost you five bulls. Hmm, ah, it's worth it. Let's go kill Joe, and I'll offer five bulls. God's happy, and I'm good, and Joe's gone. There never were offerings for intentional sin, or God would be sanctioning sin. I'm a bloodthirsty God. Go kill him, and if you kill five bulls too, hey, we're good. That's why the Christians don't understand the sacrificial offerings. The burnt offering is uh, quoted in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he talks that we are to be an offering ourselves. And the burnt offering, uh, this is, uh, oh, let me just show you this as well. All of these are also in basically uh, chapter 6 uh, and 7 as well. So these are the verses that show you, uh, that talk about each one of these offerings in drawing near to God. But the burnt offering was voluntary, had nothing to do for sin. If someone offered a dove and someone else offered a bull, they were equal in God's sight. Why? The poor person can only afford a dove, but the rich person could afford a bull. But the whole concept was this animal represents me wanting to ascend to God. Does that make sense? But think of this. How many of you would take $1,000 in cash and just burn it? I, I, I'm serious. Would you say, okay, God, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to take this $1,000 and I'm just going to burn it. We wouldn't think of ever doing that. But that's what they were doing. A bull would cost them $1,000 and in the burnt offering, the priest didn't get a stake. The person who offered it didn't get a stake. It was completely offered up to God. Wow. I mean, so it wasn't a sin offering. It was just a matter of you wanted to draw close to God. And so you would just take whatever you could afford and you'd offer the whole thing up to God. Nobody would get any of it. Okay. But uh, then, let me go back. Oop, wrong way. Okay, so that was the Ola offering. Now, the grain offering, and a lot of people say that Cain offered a grain offering, so he wasn't accepted. Not true. God loves grain offerings. The reason why Cain wasn't accepted, it wasn't the best. It wasn't his first fruits. Okay. But here, the grain offering is called the Minka offering. And that is like, I mean, if you want to meet someone, what do you do? Hey, let's go out and eat. The whole altar was to be God's table, and you would come in and sit down and have food with him. And so there would be the grain offering, and you'd get some, he'd get some, uh, and that's how it was to be. Uh, let me see. Even the Passover was a peace offering. It wasn't for sin. Passover was not for sin. It wasn't. It's a peace offering. Now we come to the sin offering and the guilt offering. But look, they were for sins of ignorance. It wasn't for intentional sins. If, if you did something and then you realize later, oh, I really screwed up, guess what? You would go do a sin offering. 
The guilt offering, again, is a sin of ignorance, but where damage has been done. If you run into someone's car, you need to not just say, I'm sorry, see you later. No, you got to help pay for the repairs. But you didn't intentionally run into that person. Okay, so that's why it's called a guilt offering, because there are some financial reparations that need to be taken care of. The only way sins were forgiven in the Old Testament was repentance and restitution, the same as today. There was no difference, okay? Now we go back to this. Okay, repentance and restitution were always required in the Tanakh. Okay, so let's look at Leviticus 1, 2 through 4. And this is the very next verse in our Torah portion. God says, to speak to the children of Israel, tell them when any one of you offers a what? An offering to the Lord, you shall offer your offering of the livestock from the herd or the flock. In other words, God is saying no chickens allowed, okay, it, or, or, you know, no pigs. It's not just kosher. There are certain animals you just don't sacrifice. Uh, if it's an offering from the herd, he has to offer a male without blemish. If he offers it at the door of the tent of meeting, so he will be acceptable before the Lord, he has to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. This is a voluntary offering. But the man would lay his, or the lady, whatever, would lay their hand on the offering. In other words, they're transferring their identity into the animal. Now, the word offering means korban. And korban is something that is brought near. A korban is not really a sacrifice, as the sense I'm having to give something up. A korban is not even an offering, as in us bringing a gift to the gods. See, there were a lot of pagans doing sacrifices to their gods, and God has to distinguish between them uh, because he doesn't want anyone to think he's some bloodthirsty God that needs animals to be sacrificed. Now, the, this entire book is how God wants you to draw close to him. How many of you know the New Testament? Draw near to God, and what will he do? Draw near to you. All right, so this is the same thing with the book of Leviticus is all about. The entire book of Leviticus is how God wants you to come clear to him in love, not out of fear of punishment, not out of a hope of reward. How many of you like your kids to only come to you when they want to borrow money? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, but we don't want them to fight to get away or be contrary. And uh, if you look at the conclusion of the book of Vaikra, the Lord calling you to draw near, but what happens? They fight to get away. How many of you ever had wanted to hug your teenager and they said, no, I'm getting out of here? Um, the other thing that I want to bring out about this book as we begin it, what are some of the names of God used in the Bible? Elohim, Adonai, the yud heh vav -Hey. But they have different meanings, slight different meanings. Elohim always means the creator, the judge, the ruler, the boss. And that's what was used in Genesis 1. But in Genesis 2, he creates man and his name changes to the Lord God. Because the Lord, the yud heh vav -Hey, represents compassion, mercy. And so it's the compassionate, merciful God that creates man. And that's what we need uh, to realize. And never, when you go through Leviticus, never is the word Elohim or judgment used in connections with the offerings. Only the yud heh vav -Hey, his attribute of mercy, is always used with the offerings. The idea that offerings were needed to pacify a bloodthirsty God was foreign to Judaism. They were drawing close to a merciful creator. Um, but at the same time, we find in the prophets a warning about religion. You know, I say God hates religion. He really does. He wants a relationship. But here's what happens when the relationship becomes monotonous and it's just a religion. Uh, it, it gets horrible. Uh, let me just see. Uh, so I want to point out that all sin is not the same. A lot of people say all sin is the same. No, I'm sorry. Stealing uh, some crackers because you're starving is different than murdering somebody. 
I mean, it's so obvious. But so many people say, all sins the same. No. Just like you can say, all dogs bark. That doesn't mean every dog is the same. Okay? And so look at this. It also depends on who sins. It's not just the sin, but who sins. Leviticus 4.3, it says, if the priest that is anointed sins, okay, he has to bring a young bull without blemish. And then look at Leviticus 4.22, when a ruler has sinned and done somewhat through ignorance, of course, against any of the commandments, it says he has to bring a male goat. So the priest who's more accountable, it costs more. Look at the cost. A bull costs a lot more than a goat. And then Leviticus 4, 27 through 28, if one of the common people sin through ignorance, they're not to bring a male goat, but a female goat. Okay, so there's different things. But here's the other thing. Bringing a sacrifice to the temple was a very public affair. Because everyone would know that you sinned based on what type of animal you brought, too. And if you're bringing it just out of love or if you're bringing something mandated. How many of you know that would be good for our politicians? It had to be a public affair whenever they blew it. Oh, talk about bringing humility. You know, uh, this was actually a very good thing. He can't hide it. They have to publicly admit that they did something wrong. Can you imagine if a judge had to admit they messed up? Wouldn't that be fun? Okay. And so again, the entire sacrificial system requires humility. That was all about. God says, look, I'm humble. I want you to humble yourself when you come to me. Don't come up to me like, look how great I am, like Solomon did in the temple, bringing thousands of sacrifice so that the temple on the very day of the wedding, so to speak, was too insignificant because all that he offered. Okay. Um, what we have to realize through the sacrificial offering is no one is above the law. Would that be good for our politicians? Um, oh, I got to hurry. Okay. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, we'll speed read. Isaiah 1, 11 through 17, if you look at what's underlined, here God says, your offerings are abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbath, the holding of, or the feast days. He says, I can't endure it. I can't endure iniquity along with the solemn assembly. And it says, your new moons and your appointed season, my soul hates. They're a burden to me. What is God saying? Many Christians say, see, God didn't want them. I say, see, you're stupid. No. <laughs> God is saying, I don't want yours. The problem is they took God's feast and made them theirs. And here they're doing offerings and they're evil. Here we find God through his prophets, he's criticizing the people for obeying his commands. He's criticizing for obeying his commands because they're doing it not with the right heart. All right? See, what's amazing is not only do we need to serve God, we have to serve him happily. No whiny whinies. The prophets were not against the sacrifices. Look at Jeremiah 17, 26 and 27. They're going to come from the cities of Judah, from the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, the low land, the high land, from the south. And they're bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meal offerings and frankincense and bringing sacrifice of thanksgiving to the house of the Lord. But then it says, but if you won't listen to me and you don't hallow the Sabbath day and you bear a burden and do all these things, you know, I'm going to devour your palaces. So the whole thing is we have to serve God not with a whiny, whiny attitude, but we have to do what he asks out of joy. This is why Isaiah 56, 7, even them, referring to Gentiles, non-Jews, will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, and even their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So the difference is, it's the problem is that the sacrifices, the problem is the attitude in doing the sacrifices. And this is one of the most horrible one of all. Think about this. This is Jeremiah 7, verse 9 and 10. God says, are you going to steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer to Baal, walk after other gods whom you haven't even known, and then come and stand before me in this house where my name is called and say, we are free from sin, basically, 
And we can do all these abominations. Why? Because uh, I have this relationship with God. And he says, no, you don't. God cannot be bribed. It says judges cannot accept bribes. God is the judge of all the earth. He will not accept bribes. So intention and your mindset are always essential in the sacrificial system. God is not some pagan God who just needs to be appeased through blood sacrifice. And the thought that if I bring a sacrifice to God, he'll overlook my other faults. The idea that I can bribe the judge of all the earth turns a sacred act into a polluted act. It produces precisely the opposite result than the one intended by the Torah. So we'll close with this verse, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories, glories in this. He knows me. He understands me that I am the Lord who does what? I exercise mercy and justice and righteousness in the earth, for these are the things in which I delight. So I hope as we study the sacrificial system uh, over the, this next tour portion, we have a completely different idea of what the sacrificial system was all about. Let's stand. Oh, I'm ex so excited about the second half. Oh, uh, and if anybody wants to come up and uh, take a look at the book, look through the pages, see the quality of the book, it'll just sitting right here. <clears throat> All right, Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, and I just pray, Lord, that many of us would have a heart of repentance and turn to you because the days truly are short. And Father, I want to thank you for all those that are here locally, all those that are uh, around the United States, online, and all over the world. We just thank you so much for all of them. We pray a blessing upon them as they want to give to you a sacrificial offering joyfully, not to be a pain, but as we bring tithes and offerings, Father, it's to be from the joy of our heart. It's not to be, okay, here you go, you know. Uh, it's God. We, we want to, even our offerings aren't acceptable if we don't have a good heart. So, Father, I just pray right now that all those who are giving from around the world to bring the light of the Torah to the nations, that you bless every single one of them in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. I think today, this afternoon, is going to be one of the most significant teachings I've ever done. And it will blow your mind, especially at the very, very, very end. But as you know, we're trying to dig deeper into the Gospels, and not just the Gospels, the whole New Testament. And so, are you ready to go digging? Yeah. Woohoo! Let's start with Matthew chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. It says, so that the word of the prophet Isaiah might come true. We have to realize everything. There's nothing new in the New Testament. What it is, it's telling us what the Old Testament was talking about. It's, it's like an explanation of this is what the prophets were saying. And we see this right here that the prophet Isaiah had prophesied something, and now they're saying, this is it. It says that the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by way of the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee they're talking about, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the who? The nations. These are people who were in the dark, and they saw a great light. You know, Yeshua's whole ministry was around the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth was his home. Capernaum is where he went. Sure, I think he only went to Jerusalem for the holidays. You know, that's a, he was required to be there for the feast for the most part. I mean, I've been to Israel so many times, believe me, I love the Galilee much more than Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you just feel the tension constantly. But uh, in the Sea of Galilee, it's so peaceful. And then it says to those who are in the land of the shade or the shadow of death, the dawn came, light shined. Well, not only did light shine, look at John 1, 4, in him was, and the life was the light. 
So when we talk about the Torah being light, Yeshua is the living Torah. He is the living Torah. And that life was the light. And that was the light, I believe, that was before the sun and the moon were created. Light was on the earth long before the sun and the moon. And I believe that light, Yeshua, is the light. Now, here's something I want to mention. I, I have to give you a story first to help you understand the rest of the news. Look at Joshua 24.2. They're getting ready to take the promised land. And Joshua says to everybody, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Okay, so Joshua is not talking here. God is talking through Joshua. And it says, your fathers. Now, who are their fathers at this time? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah the father of Abraham, the father of Nehor, and they served other gods. Okay, Abraham lived during the time of the Tower of Babel. Abraham, Nimrod, he's building the Tower of Babel, and Abraham's right there in where the Tower of Babel is, and his father, Terah, it says, made idols. Terah owned an idol shop, his father. And he literally would make and sell idols for a living. That's what he did. Now, does anybody know what Neh It doesn't mention Haran. You know why it doesn't mention Haran? Haran died. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But does anyone know what Nehor's name means in English? It's a Hebrew word. Whoever can get the answer first gets the book. What? Who said that? It was snorer. Nacor means to snore. He was the first one to snore. Come on, I've got you back. Yay! Give it again. And those of you online, if any of you online can, you already got the answer, so it's whoever's quickest. Well, there is a midrash or a story about. Tara asked Abraham to mind his idol shop while he went and did something. So Abraham, who didn't believe in idols, is minding his father's idol shops. I got a picture of a little pretend idol shop here. Now, here, someone is bringing food to a statue. Is the statue going to eat the food? Why in the world would you feed statues? Okay, well, uh, you're hoping that that God would give you some blessing. Okay, but it's still pretty stupid. Well, I mean, uh, well, I, I mean, I used to feed the Easter Bunny as a kid too, but uh, I was only a kid. But anyway, while Abraham is minding the idol shop, this lady comes in and offers food in one of the idols, and she leaves. And Abraham is so upset that they're feeding statues food. The story goes, Abraham destroyed all the idols. He smashed them to smithereens. And then he put a hammer in the one idol that was still standing there. And his dad comes home and says, what happened to this? It's everything's destroyed. And Abraham goes, I don't know, but this lady came in and offered food and everyone was trying to take the food. And so this idol here had this hammer and he destroyed all the idols. And there he is. <laughs> and his dad goes, what are you talking about? You know, this cat, these don't do this. And so Abraham says, so why do you serve them? <laughs> and that really upset Terah. So Terah went to Nimrod and told on his son, Abraham, who destroyed the idol shop. Now, this is in Babylon, right? The Tower of Babel is in Babylon. Okay, a thousand years later, you got the story of Shedrach, Shedrach, um, Meshach and Abednego, right? Throwing the fire because they went worship this idol. Well, this all originated clear back then, okay? And so Nimrod took Abraham and threw him in the fiery furnace. And then he turned to Haran and he said, do you also worship the same God Abraham does? 
Well, Haran was hesitating to see if Abraham came out alive. <laughs> well, then Abraham comes out and he goes, yes, I do. So Nimrod threw Haran in the fire. And the Bible says he died in the Ur of Chaldees. That's the fire. Haran died when he was thrown into the fiery furnace in Babylon by Nimrod. And so this is why Terah and Abraham and Sarah and Lot left. And they went up to northern Syria to Haran. Okay, so that's the behind the scenes story of why they moved. Okay, now, with that said, I want to show you this map. Here we are now, and this is modern day what? Turkey. Uh, many of us were just there this last year. We traveled all of these places over here. But Paul lived in Tarsus. There's an Antioch over here, and there's also an Antioch up here. So when you read about Antioch, realize there's two different Antiochs. But you're going to, and Tarsus was from Cilicia, all right? And you're going to see how they came to Perga. And then from there, they were going around Iconium, Lystra, Derby. But we have to know all of these are in the area of Galatia. So when you read the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians is talking about that area. All right. Okay. So in Acts 13, 14, they departed Perga and they came to Antioch in Pisidia. There's Pisidian Antioch. So they were here and they went up to there. Then it says this. They went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. What? They weren't meeting in the church? No. They were meeting in a synagogue and it was on the Sabbath and they all sat down. And after the reading of the Torah and the Haftorah or the prophets, the rulers of that particular synagogue said to them, hey, men and brethren, you're visiting. Do you have any good word for the people? They're just being very polite. Hey, we have visitors. Come up, say a few words. Well, what do we find? In Acts 14, 1 and 2, uh, just so you know, it didn't go over real well. And so now it says they went to Iconium and they went together to another synagogue of the Jews and gave such teaching that a great number of Jews and who? What? The Greeks weren't meeting in a church. The Greeks were actually meeting in the synagogue with the Jews on the Sabbath. Yes. And it says, but there were some unbelieving Jews made the minds of the Gentiles bitter. Okay, so some of the Jews who didn't believe Paul's word were raising up the Gentiles, okay, uh, to fight against the Jews that were believing. And so what do we see in verse five through seven? A violent attempt was made by the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to make an attack on them and have them stoned. And having got news of it, they decided to fight another day. <laughs> And so they went in flight to the towns of Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derby, and the country roundabout, and they went on preaching the good news. Okay. So here they went, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Okay, so that's where they went, all still in Turkey, uh, in this particular area. Now, there's something else that I want to bring up. Let me see. How many of you have heard of the Greek God? Who's the head of the Greek gods? Who's the head of the Roman God? Jupiter. Who is stupider? Okay. <laughs> but you can see they're basically look the same. The only difference is Zeus came a thousand years earlier than Jupiter. Okay. Greece had been around a lot longer than Rome had. Okay, now, look at the, uh, Acts 14, 11 through 13. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they said in a loud voice in the language of Lycaonia, the gods have come down to us in the form of men. And they gave the name of Jupiter, Okay, so these aren't in Greece. They're over here on this side. Uh, and it says they gave the name of Jupiter Barnabas 
and to Paul the name of Mercury because he was the main talker. And the priest of the image of Jupiter, which was before the town, took oxen and flowers to the doors of the town and was about to make an offering with the people. And we find in verse 14, Paul says, good people, why are you doing this? We are just men with the same feelings as you. We give you the good news so you can turn away from these foolish things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all things in them. All right. Well, let me explain the difference between Zeus and Jupiter. They both pretty much were the same, but you're another country and they have their own little fables that they make about them. But I want you to see this. While Zeus had at least six different wives, again, this is fable, this isn't true. Okay, throughout his long life, Jupiter only married once to his sister though, Juno. And both Zeus and Jupiter were known for their philandering ways and they went on to father multiple children with, two, with different women, however, of the two, Zeus was supposedly the far more promiscuous and unreliable, going to great lengths to pursue whoever might be the current object of his affection. And while Zeus went on to have around 100 different children, as a result of his endless stream of affairs, Jupiter fathered a much more modest number of 14 children. And then it says, this meant that while the Greeks saw Zeus as a lusty, all-powerful alpha male who was narcissistic and self-absorbed, Roman associated Jupiter with great dedication to the state, family, protection. And while Zeus had many powers that he would use for dramatic effect, like throwing down thunderbolts, uh, he lacked the ability, though, to determine the course of history or fate, whereas Jupiter was able to shape the course of all events on Earth, determining the destiny of humanity. And this skill meant Jupiter could call forth miracles to happen on Earth, and Romans believed in his skills so strongly they would sacrifice rams in his honor in the hope of earning favor. So I want you to see, this is the, the pagan thought, okay, that we need to understand about this. But let me show you this. How many of you heard of Socrates? Socrates lived about the time of the book of Esther, just to put things in the Bible. And so Greece, you know, they had been around for a while. And then if you'll notice, Socrates mentored Plato. Plato mentored Aristotle. Aristotle literally mentored Alexander the Great. I want you to understand history. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute and notice it's around 323 BC. Right here, we're going to read about in the book of Acts where Paul goes to Mars Hill and it says he meets the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. The Epicurean and Stoic philosophy began about 300 BC. So he, I mean, America has been a nation for a couple hundred years. We're talking for 300 years, the Epicureans and Stoics have been debating. And I'll tell you a little bit about them in a minute. But after Alexander the Great, who was in charge? Ptolemy. There was a man named Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy had a wife, supposedly. But he was known as Ptolemy the Savior. All right? And he was the Macedonian Greek general, historian, and the successor of Alexander the Great. His, her name was Thais. Do you see that? She's the queen of Egypt, and she is the spouse of Ptolemy. But you have to realize this was like 300 BC. I'm going to introduce you to someone else that I'm going to bring out again in a little bit. His name was Meander. Meander lived around that same time, from 342 to 291, and he was a playwright. He wrote over 100 comedies, and we have copies of his comedies. Okay, <clears throat> but now we're going to, uh, let me just jump back here for a minute. Okay, so here we have, after this time, Antiochus, this is Antiochus Epiphanes of the story of Hanukkah. This is the guy that wanted to kill all the Jews, well, they, if they didn't assimilate. And then now we, he was a Syrian Greek, now we come to Rome, which is Cicero, who was around 106 to 43, when Julius Caesar became the first Roman Empire, really, of the Roman Empire. 
But he's a Roman philosopher. So we have all these Greek philosophers. Now we jump to a Roman philosopher. Now this guy lived during the time of Yeshua, 63 BC to 23 AD. Okay, so he would know everything about what's going on. Well, he not only was a philosopher, he was from Greek, but he also did geography and he was a historian and he wrote this book and you can get this on Amazon. You can read what this guy wrote 2000 years ago. Okay, it's online. I think it's like 40 bucks or something. But it's called the geography of Strabo and it's how they saw the world because they didn't know about the rest of the world. So he has a map and like I said, you can get it right now online. Just type in the geography of Strabo and you can get that. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Uh, <clears throat> Strabo's life was characterized by his extensive travels. He moved to Rome around the age of 21 in 44 BC, and he stayed there studying and writing until uh, uh, at least 31 BC. And he is most famous for his 17 volume work. That's what this is, it's a 17 volume work, which presented a descriptive history of people and places from different regions of the world known in his era. But here is what he wrote that I find so fascinating. Again, <clears throat> here is Tarsus, where the apostle Paul lived. Now, if you think about Greek literature, you're going to go to the library in Athens, Greece, or Alexandria, Egypt. That, that was the two deep Greek thinking areas. And of course, many of the Jews in that day knew Greek, which is why they had the Septuagint written 200 years earlier. All right, so there's a lot of Greek speaking Jews. There's also a lot of philosophy that is written in Greek. And guess what? <clears throat> Paul studied Greek philosophy. He knew Greek. He knew, he's in Tarsus, and guess what Strabo said at the, at, during his time? He said, the people living in Tarsus have devoted themselves so eagerly, not only to philosophy, but also to the whole round of education in general, that they have even surpassed Athens and Alexandria or any other place it could be named where there have been schools and lectures of philosophers. So there's like a philosophy university in Tarsus that Paul went to. And he learned all about the Greek philosophers. If he wants to reach the Greeks, you gotta learn about the Greeks. So Paul was a Roman citizen. He knew Latin fluently. He was Jewish, he knew Hebrew, he knew Aramaic, he knew Greek, okay? He was very multilingual. Okay, so now look at Acts 21, 39. Paul said, I am a man which am a, what? Jew, I live in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. But then in Acts 22, 27, the chief captain comes and says to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he goes, yes. Okay, so Paul has two passports, maybe three. Okay, he's a Roman citizen, all right? But he's living in Tarsus, okay? And he, he knows Greek, he speaks in Greek, he speaks in Hebrew, you find all this stuff. Okay. Let me see, I wanna make sure I'm at the right place. Uh, let me say, look at Acts 17, 15 and 18. There were those who were conducting Paul and brought him where? To Athens. And then having received a command to Silas and Timothy that with all speed they need to come to him there, they departed and Paul was waiting for them where? In Athens. Okay, here we go. This is a picture I took when we were in uh, Athens last year. And uh, you can see the ancient Parthenon on the Acropolis. Here's the area during daytime. Uh, and it's that back one that you were just seeing at night. Our hotel was just over there on the other side. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Mars Hill? Right next to that, on the other side as it dips down is Mars Hill. This is Mars Hill right here and you can climb up there they have uh, stairs and you can get up there walk around and be on mars hill and look up and see that right there okay so here paul is meeting the epicurean and stoic philosophers while he is waiting for the other two people to come and so let's look at this verse act 17 15 through 18. Those who were conducting Paul brought him to Athens and having received a command again that they come to him, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. 
And the spirit was stirring in him because the city was totally given over to idolatry. Therefore, he was reasoning in the synagogue again with Jews and with Gentile worshipers. So Jews and Gentiles were not just meeting in a house of Gentiles. They met in the synagogues with the Jews. And they met in the marketplace every day with those who met with him. And then it says certain of the Epicurean and of the Stoic philosophers were meeting together to see him. And some were saying, what would this seed picker wish to say? Who knows what it means by seed picker? A seed picker was like a crow or a gull that was a freeloader who just hung around the open markets to live off the scraps. Okay, so that's what they think he is. And it goes on to say, um, what would the seed picker wish to say? And others, he's speaking of foreign gods. He seems to be an announcer because he spoke of Jesus and the resurrection proclaiming to them as good news and they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so what is Epicureanism? Did anybody take philosophy in college? That was gonna be my major, I, I, I love philosophy. Well, the Epicureans started, like I said, 300 BC. America's only been around 200 years. For 300 years, there were the Epicurean and the Stoic, Stoic philosophers that Paul studied, was very well aware of, but they'd been around a long time. The Epicureans said that the best way to be happy and not sad was to not want anything. Makes a lot of sense, right? Just don't want anything and then you will always be happy. They said it was the wanting of things that leads to pain and Epicureans had an important influence on Christianity. The Christian idea that holy people should, be sep should separate themselves from the world and not think about their bodies or think about the things that, that they own or on friends and family and just focus on heaven is what started the monasteries in the Catholic Church. You just separate yourself from anybody, don't want anything, and live at the monastery. Now, Stoics or Stoicism also started in 300 BC, uh, founded in Athens by Zeno, who was in Cyprus. And their big question is, what is truth? In other words, your truth may not be my truth. How many of you heard stuff like that today? Okay, that's what is going on back then. And they said there was no universally grounded criterion for truth. Okay, it is based not on reason, truth is based on feelings. Do we see why we're at where we're at today and how far back the roots go? That they said the best way to be peaceful was just to be moderate in everything. Do a little bad, do a little good, and you'll be peaceful if you just find the balance. Uh, don't eat too much, even of good food. They should not party too much, but they shouldn't work too hard all the time either or diet all the time. They had to find homeostasis, like a Diet Coke and a donut. Okay. Moderation. Okay. But where do you think Pilate fell? fell. Was he a Stoic or an Epicurean? Look at John 18, 37 and 38. Everyone, Jesus is saying that is of the truth. Here's my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? This tells you exactly what his philosophy was. He just revealed to you, if you understand what's going on in the day, what his philosophy was. So we, we knew that he felt truth could be his own truth. And he's trying to see if Jesus knows anything about philosophy. Okay, and uh, when he had said all this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find in him no fault at all. So Pilate's going, gee, uh, you know, he's got a little scared when the truth is standing in front of him. Now, Paul also had a problem that he overcame though. In 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul says to the weak, I became weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Okay, so he wanted to reach these Greek philosophers by out-Greeking them. He had studied all about Greek philosophy, so he's gonna take, I wanna be all things to all people, so I'm gonna become the Greek philosopher to win them to the Messiah. 
But you're going to find out, he says, boy, that was really stupid. I'll show, show you where he says that. He says, I'm going to change my ways. Okay, let's look at Acts 17 through 28. He's arguing with the Epicureans and the Stoics. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects, okay, they have idols, the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. They wanted to cover all their bases, so they would also worship the unknown God that they don't know, just in case, cover all their bases. And then Paul says, therefore, the one whom you worship, which is the unknown God, and not even knowing it, that's the one I'm telling you about. The one that you don't know, I'm going to tell you all about him. Okay? He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay, so here we have this idol And they think that idol is a god, but it was made by human hands. And he says, look, this was made by human hands. So how could you think it's a god? You're the one who made it, right? Okay, so here we go. Here is Zeus, Jupiter, whatever you want. And look at what he goes on and says. He says, the God of heaven and earth doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. In other words, they think the spiritual God Zeus dwells in a statue. And he's saying the unknown God that you know does not dwell in a statue. Is everyone following me? But I'm about to blow you away. Are you ready? Are you buckled up, shoulder strapped in? Look what Paul then says. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. So right here, nor is God worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Well, wait a minute. We worship God with our hands all the time. So what was he, what was he meaning by that? You want me to tell you what the problem was? English. This is why you want to know the original language. What he is saying here, the word for worship is the totally, completely wrong word. Now, how many of you just worship your grandchildren? Now, you don't worship your grandchildren. You know what I mean? Well, guess what? The word worshiped here is fed. In other words, God doesn't have to be fed by human beings. He's not like what your stupid statues where you go and set food down in front of them. It wasn't worship with men's hands. He's saying the God of heaven doesn't need to be fed. That's the Greek word and the Hebrew word. He doesn't need to be fed with men's hand like there's some little baby. Okay, why? Because he's the one who gives to everyone life and breath and all things. Then he says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now that's a very important statement. He's made of how many bloods? Adam and Eve, one blood, which tells you there's no such thing as human Nephilims. The whole concept that somehow demonic beings came down and had relationships with women, and now there's a bunch of human alien giants is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Sorry about those who teach that. Okay. Because he made of one blood. It doesn't say alien blood and human blood. And the biggest problem I have with that teaching, okay, who gets to decide who's the mixture of alien blood? They're going to say, I mean, uh, you could have a one world government say, okay, all the Jews are the aliens. We need to kill them all. This, this is why you don't want to go with that theory anyway. Okay, but let's go on. Look what else he says about God. He has also determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. And when it says grope for him, again, he's criticizing them. And it's like they're blind and they're groping, looking for their statue. Okay. But, But it says 
<clears throat> and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. Why? Because God is everywhere. They act like he's only in the statue there. But here's what's going to be mind-blowing. Look what Paul says. For in him we live and move and have our being. How many of you have heard that song? Well, you're going to be shocked here in a second. Then it says, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Well, wait a minute. If, how do statues have offspring? Pretty dumb. But guess what Paul is doing? Okay, here we go. For in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets. Wait a minute. How many Greek poets believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But look at right there, it says, as your poets have said, we are also his offspring. He is not talking about God here. He's talking about what their poets said. Let me show you. Paul studied Greek philosophy. He's trying to reach the Greek through Greek philosophy. There was a person named Epimenides who lived in the 6th century B.C., and he was a Greek seer. He was a philosopher and a poet. And he, I don't even know, in 600 BC, none of the Greeks knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wrote a poem about Zeus, and there are copies of his poem. And here's what he wrote concerning Zeus. They have fashioned a tomb for you, O holy and high one. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. Where have you heard that before? That's where he quotes in Titus 1.12. He's quoting this Greek philosopher from 600 years earlier saying one of themselves, even a prophet of their own. He's even telling us it's not him that the uh, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, low bellies. Why? Because the Cretans didn't believe that Zeus was, Im Zeus was immortal. But Epimenides believed Zeus was immortal. And this is why he called the Cretans liars because they did think. But Paul is quoting their prophets so he's not quoting scripture from God. He's quoting what the prophets of Zeus said. But then he says, you are not dead, Zeus. You live and abide forever, for in you we live and move and have our being. That's what they said to Zeus. This is a verse that every Christian thinks is talking about the Lord. But Paul is quoting a Greek philosopher from 600 years earlier where they said Zeus was the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Wow. <laughs> now, there was, and I took philosophy in college. There was another Greek poet named Aratus, and he was from where? Cilicia. That's where Paul grew up. And he lived in 300 BC, and he wrote a book called Astronomy. And here's what he wrote about Zeus in 300 BC. Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. Every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Uh, Paul is not writing what God says. He's writing what Zeus says and even says, as your own prophets have said. But we don't even see that. Oh, but wait, there's more. Remember Meander? He is the one that lived around 300 BC and he wrote over a hundred comedies. And in one of his comedies that was written about the queen of Egypt, okay, he said evil communications corrupts good manners. Well, guess what? That's also found in the New Testament. And people think that he was, got this from the download of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely not. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be deceived. Evil, evil company corrupts good habits. Paul is not getting this from the Holy Spirit. He's quoting Greek philosophers. From 300 to 600 years earlier. Okay, now there's nothing wrong. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that statement. But you got to study the text to know what you're talking about. Does that make sense? Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about Thais. Do you remember Thais? This is a comedy. And who was she? 
the queen of Egypt. Okay, so here she is, her picture again. But let me tell you what was really true about this comedy where Paul quotes out of this comedy. The comedy he read was about the queen of Egypt who was married to Alexander and then married Ptolemy after Alexander died that actually she was called the Hetera, which is a type of prostitute in ancient Greece who served as an artist, an entertainer, a conversationalist, in addition to providing sexual service. Unlike the rule of for ancient Greek women, Hetera's would be highly educated and were allowed to be in the symposium. So this is the play that Paul is quoting from. Paul was very educated. He wanted to out-Greek the Greeks. But again, when you study history, all of a sudden you begin to see things as they really were. But wait, there's more. Okay, look at Acts 18, 1 through 5. After this, what does Paul do? He leaves Athens and he comes to Corinth, which is right next door. I've been there. And he found certain Jews named Aquila and Priscilla, and they were born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews, they were expelled from Rome, and came to them. And because he was of the same craft, making tents, basically, he abode with them, and it says, by their occupation, they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue again, every Sabbath. Can you imagine? He went to the synagogue on Sabbath, and he persuaded the Jews and the, oh my goodness, they're not meeting in house churches, they're meeting in the synagogue, everybody, because that's where they always met. When it says they went on Friday nights or something, that's for Havdalah, you know, or for Arab Shabbat, I mean. Okay, so yeah, a lot of that's misunderstood. But anyway, it says Silas and Timothy were finally come from Macedonia and Paul was pressed in spirit and he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But now, the next book is the book of Corinthians. He's in Corinth, and he left Athens. He's now in Corinth, and look at his change of mind. Look what he says. My mission from Messiah was not to baptize, but to tell the good news, not, however, in the language of philosophy. I decided I'm not going to become all men to all people, okay? Lest the cross of the Messiah would be robbed of its meaning. The message of the cross is indeed mere folly to those who are in the path to ruin, but to us who are in the path of salvation, it's the very power of God. For the scripture says, I will bring the philosophy of the philosophers to nothing. The shrewdness of the shrewd I will make of no account. Where is the philosopher? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the dis disputant of today? Has not God shown the world's philosophy to be folly? For since the world and God's wisdom did not by its philosophy learn to know God, God saw fit by the folly of our proclamation to save those who believe in Messiah. While the Jews ask for miraculous signs, the Greeks study philosophy. We're just going to proclaim Messiah crucified to the Jews, an obstacle to the Gentiles, mere folly. So he decided to quit becoming all things to all people. He realizes you can't out philosophize the philosopher with their philosophy. So he changed his direction, but the problem is the church today is still into the Greek. They haven't changed their philosophy. Okay. So Paul gave up on the Greek mindset to win souls. But the brand new believing Gentiles who had no Torah background, they clung to it. And the Greek mindset is in the early church because Greek philosophy is all that they knew. Oh man, I'm way past time. Oh, okay, mm, okay, well, I'm almost done. Galatians 4, 8 through 11. Remember Galatians, where's the Galatians? They're the ones who are stupider and worship Jupiter, right? Galatians 4, 8, and 11, how be it then, he's telling the Galatians, when you didn't know God, you did service unto them, which by nature were no gods. You're worshiping the stars and the planets. But now that you have known God, or rather are known of God, why are you turning again to the weak and beggarly elements? He's saying, why are you going back to the pagan calendar? He says, where you desire to be in bondage, you are observing days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. And everyone says in Christian circles, well, see, you're not supposed to keep the feast days. No, he was talking to people who were worshiping horoscopes, zodiacs, astrology. And he says, why are you going back to that when you have the biblical calendar? Look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17. He's speaking to the Colossians who are the Galatians next door neighbor. 
And he's saying, don't let anyone judge you in food or drink or respect of a holy day or new moon or Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come. It's the body of the Messiah. So he's telling the Colossians, don't let these stupid Galatians who observe days, months, and years judge you because you're observing the holy day, the new moon, the Sabbath day. And people, Christians use that to say, see, you're not supposed to. You're, you're judging the pagans, you know. No, Paul is saying to the ones who are keeping the calendar, don't let these goofballs judge you because you are. They're the ones keeping the horoscope. Do you understand now how to explain those verses? Now I'm going to end with the thing that's going to blow you absolutely out of the water. Are you ready? The New Testament is always quoting the Old Testament. Here we go. In the New Testament, this is the new covenant. Now, how many of you heard of the new covenant? All Christians heard of that? This is in Hebrews 8 9, quoting Jeremiah 31. How many know Jeremiah 31 is a new covenant? And this is word for word in Jeremiah, but there's a big difference. It says, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, says the Lord. Now that sounds, ooh, that's pretty tough. But how many of you wonder if that's what Jeremiah 31 really says? Well, let's take a look at something here. Here we go, Zaitlich was a German. Now, we all know how the Germans love the Jews. He was a Lutheran as well, Lutheran. And he translated the New Testament, okay, in 1877 into Hebrew so we could have a Hebrew New Testament. And it is still considered the standard New Testament edition in Hebrew. And the 10th edition, though, was revised by a young man in his 20s named Arnold Ehrlich at his insistence. And this edition, look at this. It was intended to be used for proselytizing the Jews. Later, it was another revised again by Gustav Dahlmann, who was another German Lutheran with whom he shared a common interest in evangelizing the Jews. Plus, the Germans were a little anti-Semitic back then. But here we go. Here's the English. I regarded them not. Here is how the New Testament Greek translators translated in Greek. Here is where it says that. And here is in the transliteration. And in the Greek, it is I neglected them. Okay. It says I regarded them not in the English. In the Greek, it said I neglected them. But here's how it is in the Hebrew that Zaitlich did. You would think he would go to Jeremiah 31, 32 and just use that Hebrew. But no, we don't know if it was him or Arnold or Gustav, but here's the Hebrew. And notice it says, Bacalti, okay? Bacalti, right there is the phrase Bacalti. You see that is the chet. Everyone knows that's the chet. You can see Bacalti, the B C H L Tabud, Bacalti. Does everyone see the letter Chet? Hope you all know the letter Chet. Well, guess what Bacalti means? Bacalti means I got nauseous over them. Oh, I, I just wanted to throw up all over them. Okay, and that's the Chet. Do you see that? All right, well, let me tell you a little something else here. Okay. Franz Dalich's 10th edition, as I said, was revised by young Arnold Ehrlich at his insistence, and the edition was to proselytize the Jews. Well, guess what Arnold Ehrlich, the 20 something year old, believed? He sought to bring the results of modern textual criticism of the Bible to a wider Hebrew audience emphasizing that the Torah was only a document made by humans, complete with scribal and copying errors, and it wasn't a perfect work dictated by Moses on Sinai. So this is the guy who's coming up with the Hebrew New Testament based on the Greek, not on the Hebrew. And then, of course, we have Gustav, another German Lutheran, rewrite it again. But now, do you want to know what it actually says? Here is Jeremiah 31, 32 in English. And then I will show you the Hebrew. 
although I was a husband to them. It doesn't say I disregarded them. I wanted to puke all over them. The actual translation was, even though I was a husband to them. Now, is that not anti-Semitism? Is that not replacement theology? Look at this. The Hebrew does not say bakalti. That's an ayin. In Jeremiah, you go there, it's the letter ayin, and it's baalti, not bakalti. And here, bakalti or baalti, you can even look in Google, it can mean a husband, a master, as it is here. Nothing to do with wanting to puke him out. Now, evidently, uh, Daylitz supposedly knew Hebrew, but guess what? They were, the church is the one who hired him to translate it into Hebrew. And whoever pays you the money, you want to do what they say. Now, guess what? You know, do you want me to sh show you the Hebrew? Well, how many of you want to know what the real Hebrew says? Well, how do you know what the real Hebrew in Jeremiah? I have a 400-year-old Jeremiah scroll in my hands. I can look at what Jeremiah really said to see if it was Bacalti or Bahalti. And so I opened my scroll up, and here is it. And let me just make it a little bit bigger for you. It is Baalti. It is not Bacalti. And yet Christians to this day mistranslated the Hebrew, even into the Hebrew. But you only know this if you study and know what was going on. So here the original Hebrew says in Jeremiah, this is a 400-year-old school of Jeremiah. You can come look at it if you want. I got it. Uh, circled here where you can look and see it was Balti, not Bacalti. And so now all the Bayverdi read Hebrews say God disregarded them, threw up all over them, but it says, No, I love them so much. I was a husband to them. This is why Danny and I are putting out the Mark Belt Bible. And hopefully it'll be out uh, by the end of spring, beginning of summer, where we go through all the mistakes in the King James, all the mistakes in the Greek, all the mistakes in the Hebrew. We can't get it all done before we launch. So what we're going to do, we're going, it'll be like a lifetime download where we will constantly be updating it and you'll always get free uploads, free updates. But isn't that mind blowing how they purposely changed the Hebrew? They could have went to any Jeremiah scroll 200 years ago. This one's 400 years old to see it was purposely mistranslated. With that said, let's stand because the next service starts in five minutes. Okay.